Well, let's get another snapshot of the campaign by the numbers. David Coletto is the CEO of Abacus Data and will be joining us regularly throughout the campaign to give us perspective on polls, including his own, but not just his own. David, good to see you again. Good to see Thanks you. for being here. Uh, you've got some numbers that we want to talk about tonight. Uh, about what public opinion is t is telling us uh, as we get into the campaign now. Uh, so let's start there. Tell me what we're dealing with, a little bit of the methodology. Yeah, so, so our survey, we're going to talk about our numbers. We'll also talk about some of the other polls that have come out since, was done entirely before the, the election was called. So right. we, we interviewed uh, 2,000 Canadians from uh, September 6th to the 10th. And so uh, it's a snapshot of where we were the moment this campaign started. But as we've seen from some of the more recent polls, yeah, uh, that have been out since, with, yeah. not, not much has changed in the first few days of the campaign. I think we would expect that, you know, Canadians are warming up to the election and they're not going to just turn it on overnight. Right. So this gives us a, a, some really interesting numbers here about what people are thinking. We're four or five, six days in now, I guess. Uh, uh, even what people are thinking as they start to consider choices. So let, let's go through some of them. Uh, Want to start with the horse race? Uh, we don't want to just talk about the horse race, but it's good to establish where we are in the landscape. And, and your numbers here line up with the other polls we're seeing. Yeah, right? there's actually a pretty clear, more or less consensus at the, on the national numbers that most of the polling firms are showing that shows we're basically tied. We had the Conservatives two points ahead of the Liberals, 35 uh, to 33. Um, again, Nanos was out this morning with 34-34. Uh, um, so it's a, that, that lead for the Conservatives is, is within the margin of error. And so uh, this looks very much like the race we've, we've actually measured over the last few months, that, that we're at a stalemate um, and, and uh, as this campaign begins. Let's uh, break it down. Uh, when you look at the numbers by region, what do you see? Well, here we start to see some unique uh, and interesting dynamics, right? We know that the Conservatives are doing very well in Alberta, uh, in, in Saskatchewan in particular, also doing well in Manitoba, and they're running up big numbers there. Um, on the other side, the Liberals are doing well in Atlantic Canada. For a moment there earlier this year, those numbers had come together, but most of the polls now, now point to a fairly healthy Liberal lead in Atlantic Canada, as in Quebec, where the Liberals hold um, a double-digit lead over the Conservatives. But all eyes are also going to be on the, the places where there's less consensus among the polls. Ontario, we've got it more or less tied. Some polls have a big Liberal lead in Ontario. Some are showing it a closer race. Right. And then in British Columbia, same kind of story. Um, some polls show the Conservatives slightly ahead, some even largely ahead, but we've got them basically tied. So Ontario, uh, BC, Quebec, these are going to be obviously the key battlegrounds, but the Liberals seem to have a, a nice advantage because of these regional splits right now. They'd likely win more seats if, if these numbers hold to election. Right. I think it's re really interesting as, as you look through the numbers too, is to is to see where other parties are faring. And I think because you know, a lot of these Ontario, BC, and Quebec will be the subject of, uh, in some cases, two and three way, four way races. Right. right. So how the other parties parties are doing in those battleground ridings has a big effect. It does, and we've seen, you know, in some of these regions, some slow decline in the NDP and Green Party numbers. That's a big question. Add those two together, right. and that gives us a signal to how much left of the electorate the Liberals and Conservatives might be fighting for. If we do see what some, I think what the Liberals are hoping will happen is a polarization, a, a sort of consolidating that progressive vote, then those NDP Green numbers will continue to go down. They're holding right now. Again, as you said at the right. start, this is first impressions but people are, are very open-minded. What happens when you break the support of the, for the parties down by age? That's well, kind of age is going to be, I think, an important factor, not only in how people vote, but whether they vote at all. Uh, the Conservatives have uh, a nice 12-point uh, lead among those 60 or over, but if you look at all the other age groups, it's, it's pretty tight. Um, the Conservative vote sort of declines as you get younger. The Liberal vote holds steady. Um, you know, among those under the age of 30, all eyes are going to be on these millennials. I'm one of them. Uh, whether they turn out uh, again, but you can see the Greens and the New Democrats. If you combine those two numbers together, they do better among younger voters. That's that's a that's a real challenge, I think, for the Liberals uh, as they seek re-election because they need those young voters. Yeah. Kind of interesting in the numbers I look at them too. You, you look at that seniors, uh, you know, NDP. The NDP is the weakest in the in the seniors cohort. Yeah. Even the the NDP is the party at every day talking about protecting pensions, talking about a universal farm and care plan. Although the Greens are talking about that as well. Uh, they're apparently not getting a whole lot of love from that audience that they're spending a lot of time talking to. I, and I think it's it's partly that, you know, younger people typically don't vote NDP. Uh, older people, I'm sorry, older Canadians don't typically vote as much for the New Democrats. I also think it has a lot to do with their leader being relatively unknown, and, mm -hmm. and we'll, I mean, we'll talk about that in this moment. All right, let's, let's move to the leaders and, and how they're being viewed. Let's start with Justin Trudeau. What are 
what are your polling yeah, well, we're, we're actually seeing a status quo uh, for Mr. Trudeau's personal numbers uh, for the last few months. The starts the campaign basically where he's been, and that is almost half the country view him negatively, about a third view him positively. That's been the, the way basically since uh, February uh, of this year when the SNC Lavalin controversy kind of re reset the, the people's views of the Prime Minister. Um, and so he starts this election in a very different place than he did four years earlier where people had a kind of a mixed view of the Prime Minister. Now it's more decidedly negative. And what about Andrew Scheer? Well, Andrew Scheer starts in a similar way, maybe less negative than the Prime Minister. More people view him negatively than positively. There's still a lot of people out there, uh, though, who don't have much opinion about Andrew Scheer. Those, you can see these two lines have gone up over the course of the time he's been leader, but um, there's still a, he's still a blank canvas to a lot of Canadians. And what about Jagmeet Singh? Uh, some a little bit of change happening there. Yeah, this is one of the few areas where we've actually seen some movement. Um, his, his positives are up four points uh, since the end of August. Um, he's, it's the first time in a long time in which more people view Mr. Singh positively than negatively. This is not a trend, it may be a blip, but I think you know there, there are some accounts that he's had a good start to this campaign, and so as we do more polling, uh, we're gonna go on the field Friday, we'll start to see whether uh, these numbers improve for the, the NDP leader. And what about the leader of the Green Party, Elizabeth May? Well, she's, the, she's in, a, in the uh, enviable position as really being the only leader that has you know, a real solid positive uh, perception among Canadians. 33% view her positively, 19 negatively. Um, that's something that I think she's going to be using to try to convince people that they should take a look at the Greens and maybe do something they've not done before, which is vote green. And then you asked about preferred prime minister, and it's kind of, it's good to sort of find out what people are thinking uh, as they start to make choices, and in particular for the two men, right? Yeah. Uh, the two men who, for the moment, seem to be the, the, the two, the two uh, political leaders, Justin Trudeau and Andrew Scheer, have a shot at winning government. Yeah. Well, you know, like the ballot question, this one is very close as well. Although, in this case, Mr. Trudeau's got a slight two-point advantage over Mr. Scheer. Uh, but you can see that's basically tied. Elizabeth May, Jagmeet Singh fighting it out for third and fourth, uh, and then Max Bernier is at 5%. So, you know, preferred prime minister is strongly related to your vote choice, which shows the power of leadership and, and that choice in, in driving people's uh, uh, views. And then next what you did was you, you put the two yeah. front-runner choices between them and you sort of canvassed parties, right? So which one of the two do you want? Well, I think conventional wisdom would say most New Democrats and Green Party supporters, for example, would much prefer Mr. Trudeau to Mr. Scheer. That's not necessarily how this thing plays out. In fact, when you ask all people, if you only had the choice between Mr. Trudeau and Mr. Scheer, who would you choose? You can see it's basically split 50-50. The Prime Minister's got a four-point advantage uh, over Mr. Scheer. And as, a, as you would expect, um, liberals and conservatives, they lean very heavily to their, their leader in right. terms of who they'd prefer. But look at New Democrats, Green Party supporters, uh, even the bloc. The cons liberals have Mr. Trudeau as a slight advantage, but it is not as, as clear as you might, you might expect, which tells us that politics is not always linear. Just because you're a New Democrat supporter doesn't mean your second choice is always going to be the liberals. Um, and in this case, you're really looking at these two choices, and you might be saying, I don't really like either of them. Um, and if I had to choose, maybe I do choose Mr. Scheer. Maybe I do choose change. Yeah. Let's look at uh, the possibility of change here and, and what voters, how, how locked down are the votes as the campaign gets underway? I guess that's the way to put it. Well, the answer is not that much. Um, almost four out of 10 Canadians, or just over four out of 10 Canadians tell us they are either very likely or somewhat likely to change their mind. And this is among people who have a preference right now. Um, and so what we suspect is that over the campaign, this should, this should firm up. But what's interesting is over half of NDP supporters, over half of Green Party supporters, tell us they are likely to change. They are the most open to mm -hmm. persuasion, which, um, again, is, is really what this election seems to be about, is where do those voters go? Do they, do they leave sort of their home right now or uh, to, to maybe support the Liberals right. or the Conservatives, or do they stay and are... Um, those parties able to grow and pull in some of the switchers from other parties. Yeah, and that's why you heard, I think you, you heard Elizabeth May again today saying that, look, this is the election where we could end up with a minority parliament. Don't think about strategic voting. Vote for the part, you know, vote for what you want. And right. so that's an effort to counter this, this, you know, yeah. uh, certain softness and in, in support that might be prepared to go somewhere else, right? And, and I think these two parties in particular over their history, except in 2011, have always had to deal with this. It's, it's something that, that is a challenge with our system where 
you, you, you know, your votes don't always get translated into seats. And if the switchers switch, if I can put it that way, yeah. where are they likely to go? Well, they're going to kind of scatter, right? There's no, there's no, I guess, logic or ration, rational uh, choices that, that we'd expect, right? Liberals more likely to go to New Democrats uh, and the Greens, but a quarter would go to the Conservatives. Among Conservatives, they split all over the place, right? Again, 22% of Conservative supporters say their second choice is the NDP, not the People's Party or the Liberal Party. So, uh, you know, these, these kind of, um, these numbers confirm again what I said earlier, politics isn't as linear as we imagine. Even, you know, 16% of NDP potential switchers say their second choice is the Conservative. So, it means it's messier um, and it's not so, so neatly put together. Let's finish on this uh, next uh, graphic that speaks to a, a campaign that's about four different voter pools. Tell me about Yeah, that. so this is a way I was trying to understand how, how we can really under, like, get a sense of the, what this campaign is going to be about. And we asked people in the survey, are you open to voting for the main parties? And when I slice and dice that question into different pieces, it basically produces four groups that I think the parties are, are going to be communicating with in different ways. Right. You've got 30% of Canadians who say they would be open to voting Conservative but not Liberal. Now they're open to other parties but they would right. not consider mm -hmm. voting Liberal. You've got about the same number who say they are open to voting Liberal but not Conservative. And so these, so that's 60% of the electorate that, you know, will never move. Yeah, two they, sort they of isolated gonna, universes, yes. right? Then you've got about one out of five, 20% or so, 19% who say they'd be open to voting for both the Conservatives and Liberals. Um, and so if this election becomes about, and it's not necessarily going to be about, but if it becomes about which of these two options Canadians would rather be in power, would rather be Prime Minister, mm -hmm. then that 20% becomes really important. Because right now the Liberals have a slight advantage over the Conservatives among that group on how they would vote, but they are much more open to persuasion, much uh, more willing to potentially switch. The last group is the 20% on the outside. They say they would not consider voting for either the Liberals nor the Conservatives. And so that's where you see these fights between the NDP and the Greens. Right. They're going after those voters, those that have counted out the two big ones, um, and now are deciding which one is the best shot at, at you know, representation in the House and, and uh, representing my values. So okay. it's, it's, it's really interesting when you look at it from that perspective. Let's finish on this. So the upshot, where are we day six of the campaign? What, what, what does your information tell us? The rest of the polling information tells what story and kind of a headline? It's telling us that this race is still very, very close. It's, it's almost exactly where we were, I think, um, not only at the start of this campaign, but even a few months before it. Um, I think it's highly volatile, uh, uncertain, and voters are probably now warming up um, and, and starting to think about their choices. And that 20%, that swing vote, um, will be really critical. So um, hence why all these parties are working so hard, because there's a lot of people who haven't made up their mind. David Coletto, as always, thanks for your time. Thanks, Peter.